So we've seen how file structures can be abused to gain arbitrary read and write primitives, but there's some additional exploitation vectors that involve file structures that are worth discussing. And in order to do so, we have to mention something called IO File Plus. Now, IO File Plus is an extension of the traditional file struct that we've referred to up until this point. However, the only difference between IO File Plus and File is one additional pointer appended to the end, which we see here on the right. Now, this is a pointer to a vtable or a virtual function table. Now, a virtual function table is a table that is full of function pointers. So it's just a bunch of function pointers in memory in the series. Uh, we commonly find these function tables in C++ binaries because they allow for dynamic function resolution at runtime. And this is a problem that you have in higher level languages where you have classes and objects with inheritance and multiple inheritance and polymorphism. Uh, you can have some object where you need to call a method, but the exact function that it's going to resolve to may not be known at compile time. So we use these virtual function tables as a trick to get around that. So at the end of the file structure, we have this pointer to a vtable as shown here. And the exact function that's called will be determined by the offset from the vtable that's specified. And we see this in a number of the streaming IO functions. For example, inside of fwrite, we have the assembly instruction call R15 plus hex 38. In this instance, we didn't include it in the slides, R15 is the vtable pointer. So this is taking R15 and offsetting it by hex 38 bytes. This will ultimately call the function IO new file xs put n. Let's formulate how we can exploit this vtable pointer. Well, what if we created our own exploit v table? And it doesn't matter where we put this. This could be on the stack. This could be on a heap. This could just be somewhere that we have the ability to write. And so we create our exploit v table. And then at the desired offset, so like let's say we're targeting f right here, at our exploit v table plus hex 38, we could place an address that we want to call then all we have to do is overwrite this vtable pointer to point to our, our exploit vtable. And then when we get to fwrite, it would reference our exploit vtable and call whatever we decided. Well, let's also think about what happens if we have to overwrite this whole file struct. The vtable is all the way at the end. So if we're gonna overwrite it, we have to clobber every single value that is in the file struct. Now we've seen from the arbitrary read and write that a lot of these we can set to null or some default value and it doesn't really cause a problem. But if we're going to write all the way through the file struct, there is one value that can be problematic. And that is the lock. Now we haven't talked about the lock. Well, the lock is a pointer that is used to manage multi-threaded access to a file. Remember that the file is really a buffer in memory. And so if we have multiple threads trying to access this buffer at the same point in time, it's very likely that we'll end up in some kind of invalid state. For instance, if we have multiple writers trying to write their data into the buffer, we'll actually get neither, right? We'll get some intermingled mix. And so this lock value is important. It's a pointer to somewhere in writable memory. And we want to make sure that the value that it points to is zero. So the way that a lock works is when the lock is obtained, we write a value into that memory address. And then when we free the lock, uh, we reduce that number. So this works just like a mutex. And so we want it to be somewhere that is writable that also happens to have a value of zero because that will allow us to then access the underlying file. We won't lock ourselves out with the lock. Pointing the lock to an invalid memory address will result in a seg fault. So we have to tackle this problem. Now let's assume that we've dealt with that lock problem. We have our own exploit v table sitting somewhere in memory. We've overwritten the file struct, passed the lock, and overwritten the v table pointer. We've made the v table pointer point to our exploit v table. 
And we specifically know that we are targeting F right. So our exploit V table can be full of nulls, except for the plus hex 38 offset, where we have strategically placed the address of the very well-known win function. Then F right is called. F right calls R15 plus hex 38, which we know R15 is now our exploit V table. And that plus hex 38 points to win. Did we gain control of execution? No. Modern libc performs a validation step on the vtable pointer to make sure that the vtable pointer points to a region of memory that libc has specifically set aside to contain vtables. So we can't make the vtable pointer point to our own vtable that we have constructed. We can, however, still influence that vtable pointer. The new restriction here is that the vtable pointer must point to somewhere in the vtable area, right? And the vtable that it is initially pointing to is not the only vtable in that area. This means that we can change the vtable pointer uh, to point to a different vtable or even a, a strange offset. So we have some control and influence over what function will be called, but we are restricted to mostly functions that are inside this vtable area. So that means that there are a number of interesting candidates. Now, one of the ones that is commonly used for file structure exploits is to try and call this IO file overflow. And the reason that we want to try and get IO file overflow called is because it calls do alloc buff. Okay, what's the big deal about do alloc buff? Well, do alloc buff uses another V table that is located in the Y data member of the file structure. And it accesses this V table without that verification step. So what is Y data? We, we just keep coming up with new fields here. Well, Y data is yet another field that exists in modern file structs. It was created to handle wide character streams, not specifically Unicode, but um, streams that involve characters that are multi-byte. Now, the definition of the Y data because the wide data is in fact a struct in and of itself is very similar to the definition of the file struct that we discussed uh, earlier in the first lecture. And that includes this vtable pointer that we just introduced in this lecture. I'd highly encourage you to click the link in this slide to see the literal definition of the wide data struct. We now have all of the information necessary to pull off this exploit. First, we're going to set the file's wide data to be somewhere in memory. And that wide data has a vtable. And we're going to set that vtable to point to our exploit vtable. Next, we'll overwrite the file structs vtable such that IOW file overflow will get called. Now, when that gets called, do alloc buff is called. Do alloc buff will reference the file Y data V table to then call the function that is written there. And it will do so with no check. Now, there's a lot of moving components here, so I don't want to do this full exploit uh, here during the lecture. But I can at least take a look at this in GDB so we can get an idea of what's going on. All right, so what we have here on the left-hand side is a vulnerable C program. Uh, this program is extremely generous, uh, but what we have here is we have a vulnerable win function. Uh, main is going to leak out the address of win. It's also going to tell us where puts is inside of libc. It's then going to call fopen on dev null. Uh, next, it will, it will allow us to read into the stack uh, whatever we want. Uh, there is a giant buffer sitting on the stack here, and it tells us the location of this uh, buffer uh, and then allows us to write whatever we want into it. Uh, lastly, uh, the program will let us know that we can overwrite the file struct 
and then allows us to do so. It then calls fwrite on the file struct and then calls exit. Now, because it calls exit, we can't use an arbitrary write to overwrite the saved rip. And if we compile this, we'll see that we also have full relro. So we can't do anything uh, fancy here with the GOT. So let's look at how this program runs normally on its own. We do start. We're now breaked at the beginning of main. Uh, what I'm interested in, though, is what happens at fread, just in normal operation without an exploit payload, so or fwrite. So let's set a breakpoint at fwrite and continue forward. Uh, anywhere that it's prompting for input, I'm just going to hit return. So now we are here in fwrite, and if we look at the disassembly of it, if we scroll down here a little bit, we should see a call, uh, and we do. We see a call instruction. And in fact, this call instruction is the same instruction that was shown in the slides earlier. So at fwrite plus 179, uh, we will call whatever is at R15 plus hex 38. So let's set a breakpoint at fwrite plus 179. Okay, we are now at fwrite plus 179, and let's take a look at what is R15. So R15 is just kind of this address, and this doesn't have a whole lot of meaning to us right now. But we do see in the backtrace here that we have the pointer to the file struct as an argument to fwrite. So we can print this file pointer. Now notice that GDB identifies that this is a pointer to a file struct. What this means is that we can dereference FP, and now we see the fields of that struct. We have the flags uh, with OXF bad, as well as other familiar things that we've talked about earlier. Now what I don't see here is the V table entry, because the vtable entry should be at the end of this. And that's because GDB is treating this as a file pointer. And so we'll need to cast it to be an IO file plus pointer. Now we see the file struct that is embedded in the file plus, as well as the vtable entry. So what was that R15 again? R15 is this vtable entry from the file struct. So this is something that we would have control over. Now, what does a vtable look like in GDB? Well, we can examine 20 addresses at R15. Let's see, let's see what's there. Now, we see this is the IO file jumps vtable. And these over here are all functions that are in it. Now, if I print more addresses, we'll see that immediately after the file jumps vtable is an IO string jumps vtable. And we could continue to dump out more addresses ahead or behind to see what functions are in this region. And all of these are valid jump targets as far as libc's vtable pointer validation is concerned. So we could possibly change our vtable pointer instead of pointing to this IO file jumps, the beginning of that, it could be anywhere in here to control what is actually called. Now we said that the instruction is the going to call whatever's at R15 plus hex 38. So let's see what that is. Well, it's going to call IO new file XS put N, which we should see right here. 
And the reason that this is the function that's called is because it is hex 38 away from the V table entry. So by moving the V table pointer to point somewhere else, wherever the V table pointer points, if we add hex 38 to it, that is what function will get executed or called. Now we can step inside this function, but this isn't very interesting. This is how it's supposed to behave kind of out the gate. So let's just finish this out and we see that it exited normally. Now we're going to run my exploit code and see how it behaves differently. So here we are at the beginning of F right, and we can probably set that same breakpoint to be at F right plus 179. So now we're back here. We have R15, and we should have our file pointer. Now you'll note that I don't have the flags set, and that's because this file struct that we're seeing in GDB is my exploit file struct. But we still need to cast it in order to see that V table. Now we see that I've overwritten the V table entry such that it will jump to this specific address, right? That's where the V table is. And if we look at this address plus hex 38, I have crafted this such that when this call instruction is executed, it is going to jump to hex 38 plus this address, and that will send, send me to IOW file overflow, which is what we mentioned in the slides. So let's step into that. Now here I am in W file overflow. If we march forward here, we now call w do alloc buff. Now this is where we want to be. You'll see right here at this dereference of R RDI plus hex A0, this is taking the file struct, which is what's in RDI, and grabbing the Y data value, which is hex A0 into the file struct. So it's putting that wine data pointer into RAX. Actually, though, yeah. And as we move forward, right here, we see RAX, which is our wide data pointer being offset to get the V table of the wide data struct. And that is now being moved into RAX right here. So if we step one more, this right here is my wide data struct. And we should see that. 7748 right here in my file struct, I have constructed it such that the Y data pointer is this value, which is what we see right here in RAX. So as we step through this, we're now going to be dereferencing or pulling an offset from the Y data pointer to get the V table. So now this RAX is my V table in the wide data struct that is in the file struct. 
And this final call here is offsetting the V table in the wide data struct in the file struct by hex 68. Let's see what my exploit has, has that set to. This is going to call the win function. And if we continue, it said false. But you know what it did before it said faulted? It said you win. So we were able to take advantage of these virtual function tables to execute whatever we wanted. Now, I didn't show the exploit code in the demo, and there was a good reason for that. A large part of the challenge of this module is reasoning about how to meet these requirements to pull off a vtable um, exploit in a restricted environment, and kind of how do we think about structs, or how do we think about a pointer to a struct, or a pointer to a struct that has a member that is a pointer and kind of doing this, this memory math and having a model of working with that. Now, for me, GDB is an amazing tool to kind of march my way through this. And so I'd strongly recommend uh, that you give GDB another try if you have forsaken the tool. Because my example challenge here was extremely gracious. It gave us a lot of, a lot of leaks. It gave us a whole page of memory for us to place whatever we'd like. I'm not saying that my exploit used this whole page of memory, but if I wrote a whole V table and then another V table and then a file struct and then a, a wide data struct, and I wrote all of that into memory, I'm going to start using quite a bit of space. Now, you can still pull off a vtable pointer exploit or exploit the vtable pointer without needing a massive amount of space. And the way that you do that is by overlapping structs. So not only will this module ask you to reason about structs and the offsets into them and how a pointer to a struct and then an offset to it that is a pointer and how to kind of set that up in memory uh, but as the restrictions get you know, a little bit tighter here, you'll have to use a small memory region to represent more than one struct. And the way that you do that is you recognize that the only values that truly matter as far as the execution path that your exploit is going to take are the values that are actually accessed. If I say that there is a struct somewhere, but the only value that's accessed is the struct plus hex 20, then the only value that matters in that entire struct is the bytes there that are written at the pointer plus hex 20. And so you can use this knowledge to place several structs in memory effectively in the same place because the only values of those structs that are being accessed do not overlap. Now, this will definitely take a little bit of experimenting and playing around with GDB to reason about how exactly this works, but it's an extremely powerful thing to realize and apply in your exploits. On an unrelated note, uh, file structs are chained. They're actually in a linked list. And the reason for this uh, is because sometimes the buffers don't get flushed, right? You can call fwrite and that there's no guarantee that that gets flushed out to a file when fwrite is called. It could just be sitting in the buffer. So what happens if you call fwrite and then exit? Well, the streaming functions or the streaming components of the library here have to make sure that that data does get flushed out to the, to the file. And so it will go through this linked list to flush all of the files and ensure that all of the representative reads and writes have in fact occurred. And if you explore the, the chain on, uh, 
a file that's opened in like your user uh, program, uh, you you will find uh, down the linked list uh, standard in, standard out, and standard error. Just as a kind of random factoid. So these chained file structs uh, do have a exploitation use. If we know that every file that's open for writing needs to get flushed, and we know that the act of flushing the file stream is going to use virtual functions and a V table and is vulnerable to the type of exploit that we discussed up here, then we could perform a V table exploit on multiple file structs such that instead of calling a win function, each file struct has a VTable exploit that runs one ROP gadget. You can then call one gadget for every file that is getting flushed at close and effectively ROP through the cleanup of the file structs. Uh, this is known as file stream oriented programming. Very crazy stuff. So while on the topic of file structs and file streams, kind of the power of this type of exploit, uh, particularly uh, messing around with the file struct V table pointer, uh, it's worth mentioning a blog post uh, that is entitled Angry FS Raw. Uh, and this is a, a blog post by one of the ASU CEFCOM Labs PhD students, uh, Kyle Bott. Uh, you may have seen him in the Pwn College Discord from time to time. And what Kyle did uh, is he re realized that the limitation on the VTable pointer uh, is a enumerable space. And so he decided to use anger to enumerate uh, what possible execution states are there for every VTable entry, right? For setting the VTable to be anything that it possibly could be within that validated libc memory region. Uh, while doing so, uh, he was able to discover some new exploitation techniques uh, that exist there. Uh, I'm not going to spoil the blog post, so if you do have the time, I'd highly recommend to check it out. Uh, as this was just a few months ago, uh, and brand new uh, file struct techniques uh, being published. Definitely some cool stuff.